15th. Can I get a motion? Um, oh, wait, oh, I can't read. Oh, can we waive the reading of the minutes from the previous committee meeting? So moved. Can we get a second? Oh, I'll say, do, do we have a roll call? Do I miss a roll call? Do we roll call to start the meeting too? Maybe we do. Sorry, Ken. Yeah. Sorry, yes. <laughs> okay. See, let's start over. Okay, Catherine, would you call the roll, please? Legislator Chase? Here. Cody? Here. Bush? Here. Kenny? Here. Chairman Abbott Keenan? Here. All present. Okay, so we have Peggy on the first and the second on Ken to waive the previous committee minutes. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Do you need to roll call that or no? I've got it for that. That's okay. Great. <laughs> okay. And then can we get a motion for the approval of the minutes from the previous meeting? I'll move it. And I'll second, second it. Great. Um, <laughs> any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, thank you, Bill. <laughs> so item C, um, we have our Commissioner of Social Services and Economic Security, Sarah Merrick, joining us. And it's item 1A, authorizing an intermunicipal agreement with the City of Syracuse for the administration of and reimbursement of certain HUD funds to address homelessness in the City of Syracuse as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that amount is $1,965,262. Sarah? Gotta unmute myself. Okay. Morning, and I, yeah, everyone. Good morning, morning, Sarah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so there is a lot of federal effort going on, uh, and there are different um, funding pots, basically, that are coming available to help um, people avoid homelessness, to prevent evictions. So this is going to get complicated to the public. Uh, we're hoping um, we, the department, can get some information out to uh, the public. We're, we're going to target uh, the 70,000-ish SNAP recipients because we believe they are the most vulnerable uh, in this COVID crisis. So let me just back up. So Normally, the only funds available to help people prevent evictions is temporary assistance. Um, so, but the income eligibility level for temporary assistance is extremely low. Just to give you an example, for a family of four, they have to have less than $10,000 of resources, earned income, a car, a home. So that's extremely low. So not a lot of people are eligible for temporary assistance. We can't help a lot of people prevent eviction. Um, so this um, resolution is to accept two uh, funding sources from HUD. One is um, emergency solutions grant. Uh, the second is community development block grant money, all to target uh, different income levels to help avoid homelessness to avoid evictions. The city of Syracuse received these dollars through HUD and reached out to the Department of Social Service to say, Let, let's do what we did as a partnership when the Great Recession happened. And you did the same thing. Back in 2009, there was about $2 million we received from this city and we ran the homeless prevention and rapid rehousing program. We did the very same thing. We're gonna use these dollars. People are gonna either come to the second floor or we're gonna urge people to call our general number. And we are going to analyze what income level they are at. So if they are low, low, low income, they'll be eligible for temporary assistance. If they are 50% of the median income, 
that is just to give you an idea that is about someone earning a little under a family of four i'm going to give you examples of families of four a little under forty thousand dollars all right and then if their income is too high for that they will be eligible for the community um the, the community block grant dollars because that income eligible level is 80 percent of the median income or for a family of four um a little over sixty thousand dollars so this resolution is to accept the city dollars so that the department of social services can administer the financial aid portion the financial aid portion again is to pass to pay for rent arrears to pay pay for future rent uh, and to pay for utility arrears all to stabilize housing and to prevent evictions. Um, so that's in a nutshell what we're going to do. Um, I, I think we, we did it well successfully back in 2009. I think we will do it successfully um, uh, over the next uh, couple months. The federal government wants this money to go out really fast. So I anticipate the program starting August 1st and a really busy three months of getting this money out. Now, just to give you a heads up, there's a next another round of allocations. So probably we'll be coming to you again for a second resolution to accept more money from the city um, to do this very same activity, which is to prevent evictions. Um, also, so sometimes, uh, lack of resources isn't just the reason why they're failing to pay rent. So we uh, are going to be, because these are contracts the city has set up, uh, we will be referring people to Catholic Charities and Salvation Army for follow-up uh, case management. And luckily, we just heard from the Financial Empowerment Center, and they have a grant so that they're going to be able to co-locate a counselor right here on the second floor of the civic center uh, so we will be able to refer people if they need financial counseling um, if the issue just isn't um, you know a temporary loss of wages that in case the situation is more complicated uh, reason why they are facing eviction so that is in essence what this resolution is all about any questions? Yes, I have a question. So, so from, from a staffing standpoint, um, how does this affect your ability or to continue doing everything else you're doing? Are you able to do this um, with what you have right now? I'm just curious. Well, we're going to do the best we can do. What we, what is important is that why go through temporary assistance? One is for low, low income individuals, we want to make sure that they're accessing temporary assistance. The other reason why I go through the Department of Social Services, we, we have accesses to a lot of different databases. So um, we really can assure that uh, the taxpayer that uh, these dollars are being used uh, effectively and wisely that, that in essence, the people coming to us are truly um, financially in need and they had no other options. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use our current temporary assistance eligibility staff and we're, we're hoping to bring back two retirees uh, that just recently retired um, to augment the team uh, to hopefully be able to process this, uh, this financial aid over the next three months. So we're, we're going to try our best. Can I ask one more question too? How many sure. people do you anticipate that this will fall into this category to qualify for the aid? Well, the first round of ESG, we anticipate about 800 people. Um, the, the first round of the emergency solutions, 400. So if we get another, um, you know, second round of the same amount of money, you, you double that. Now I wanna, I wanna also say that the 
county community development office, they also received an ESG allocation. Because it's a department to department um, um, agreement, uh, we're, not, we're not coming to you to present that part, but there is another approximately um, uh, uh, $1.4 million in county ESG money uh, that we are going to use the same way. Um, again, community, uh, the Department of Community Development, they're gonna hold that money. We're gonna expend the cost and then, and then ask for reimbursement. So that's why we're not coming to you for a resolution. But it's a full package of using city money for city residents and county ESG money for county residents. And, um, and again, uh, I think that, that this is just the beginning of a lot of federal money coming down through the pipeline to keep people housed. Great, any questions you guys? Yeah, how do you uh, determine the administrative uh, charges, charge back to the city? Yeah, what we're gonna do is we're gonna probably have to do time studies. And what will happen is any time that we are working on one of these uh, grants, ESG or the community block grant, or even this, the county, we, we are going to um, charge back and get administrative uh, reimbursement. So that's the one good thing in the past, in 2009 when the financial situation was better, we basically did not um, charge any um, administrative fee for doing this, made it very clear with the city that we are not in that shape. And so luckily then all of the employees working on the um, ESG and community block grant, uh, we will be able to hopefully reimburse all of the local dollar costs um, um, that are, are spent on this and claim the state, federal and state government for the, the temporary assistance work that they're gonna be able to continue. So I, I think it will help the bottom line with our budget. Because according to this, it sounds like we expend the money and then the city gives us the money. Is that how it works? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be moving this quickly. We will, at the end of the month, send a report. We'll send them over a report. They will review it, then they'll cut us a check. So this is this is gonna happen really quickly. Because in the uh, the whereas, is it talks about administrative expenses that yes. will be paid for yes. whatever whatever uh, cost it is to the, the county. The city's not in a position to administer this program themselves, is that why they come to us? Correct, they're, they're not, the city does, we really are the, um, the only department, whether you look at county or city, we're in the only department that is in the business of processing rent payments on a massive scale. Um, so this is this is really our business. So why not use why not use the the system we have in place um, and pay? And often we we've got forty thousand landlords in our system. So um, we'll one of I'm I'm, I'm I will put money on this, that um, we have a landlord in the system that we'll be cutting a check uh, for ESG or the community block grant money too. I, I may have missed it, but how many months do you anticipate we're going to be able to help with the rent of different individuals? I mean, how long is this you program know, gonna run for? Right, right. E each of these uh, pots of money have different criteria that's why it why don't they make it just one standard but they don't so some of these let us pay six months of rental arrears and three months of future rent payments and then that those are that's kind of the 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 window we've got um so we are going to try to do what is best for the 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 client to keep them housed but it's very clear that uh, at least the, this first round of money, the, the federal government wants it out in the next three months. But, but are these people in the program recertified every month? Or how do you know that they're continuing to be eligible? Well, 
we're going to evaluate their situation when they present to us and make right. a deter make a determination if it's arrears or if we need to give them both arrears and future rent payments. Pay um, forward. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Sarah on this? Uh, yes, I do. Is um now the people that are going to be eligible for this um are pretty much are you going to know about them because they're already hooked up with somebody with one of the other agencies or yeah. like can somebody that's never had a problem before come down to your department and apply for this absolutely i think this is going to reach a new audience i i do think it's going to reach um the income range that snap snap uh recipients they know us but they they don't really come, have to come downtown and we're going to urge people that even for this they don't have to come downtown we can do this all via over the phone all right um but we are going to try to do some mailers again that's going to be covered under our administrative dollars so it it, it we'll, we'll get that covered we're going to try to do some outreach to non for profit so they understand that there are these resources. Um, hopefully, the county executive and the mayor will do a press conference to get some media attention on this. Uh, I, I do think this is a different audience, um, and so we got to get the word out. Uh, Sarah, in okay, somebody applies for this and they're deemed eligible. So are we giving them the money or are we giving the landlords the money? This all goes directly either to the landlord or the utility company. This is, this is not a payment to, to a client. Okay. But it has to be the client that applies for it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Sure. Anyone else? Yes. I'd like to ask, um, Thank you, Sarah, very much. Sure. Will we be getting a report at some point of how much money was spent on rent and how much on utilities and how many people this affected? Um, we will. We certainly provide a report. Um, you know, once we start, we need to start August 1st. I'll have a report, a monthly report, if that's something that you're interested in. I'm not looking in. for names. I'm, I would like to know the number of people and uh, uh, that are getting this help. And I, I'd like to make sure that, um, is there a way to prevent duplication in, in, in yep. regards to someone? Like, I'm, I'm confused. If there's a person out there that had a job and, and they got laid off, so they're getting unemployment and they're getting an extra $600 possibly. So will they be getting help or will their income be way too much? They possibly could be eligible, but one reason why you go through the Department of Social Services, our department, we, we have access to unemployment, the unemployment database. We have access to the IRS database. We, we look at people's assets. So we will have to verify that they are fit one of these medium incomes um, and, and then and, and deem whether they are still eligible. But uh, getting unemployment insurance is not a reason that they would be not eligible. Let's put it that way. Okay, thank you very, very much. You're very welcome. Okay. Any, if there aren't any other questions, um, I would like to get a motion and a second um, for item C, C1A. Um, would I would like to move it. Great, thanks Peggy. Second? I'll, do, I'll second it. Okay, Bill on the second. And we need any other discussion? Okay, then we need a roll call vote please, Catherine, thanks. Legislator Chase? Yes. Cody? Yes. Bush? Yes. Kenny? Yes. Chair Abbott Keenan? Yes. 
Five ayes, no nays. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Right, so, thanks, Sarah. Thank also, you. thought it was important to have Sarah here for any questions. We hear, we've seen a lot, um, you know, in the daily um, updates that were occurring and now the, you know, frequent updates from our county executive, um, but in specific regards to social services, um, you guys obviously have been burning the candle at both ends. We very much appreciate it. And, and I just thought it'd be great for anybody on the committee who has questions about where you're at. Um, we're gonna have the budget coming up soon. I think it's important to keep us informed and, and stay in contact and bring each other along together so we understand um, where the needs lie. So Sarah, would you give us any kind of update on anything that you find pressing or um, important for us to know? Yeah, th thanks. Um, and thanks for that recognition. Uh, yep, we were, we are an essential, essential department and we have been up and running throughout this whole uh, process. I, I really want to give a shout out to my, my uh, employees, a um, little under 400 of them. Uh, uh, they, we, we turned on a dime basically. We were a department that needed to be 100% in this building um, because uh, we're, our system is built on the state um, network. And we're, our computers are basically hardwired into the state network. And so uh, before COVID, people couldn't work from home. So COVID hit and we needed to get people out of here. And we really rapidly got people figuring out how to remotely access into their workstations and keep the services going for a lot of needy residents in, in Onondaga County. So um, I would say that uh, the first couple crises that hit was before unemployment and, and insurance helped people we were flooded with uh, uh, SNAP applications. Um, we, were, we were up 72% over uh, what was our normal in February. And uh, we were having about 130 a day um, uh, or uh, about 3,000 were coming in, in in just the month just those few weeks when March 17th hit and the first couple weeks in, in April before unemployment started getting distributed to people, people were really panicking. And um, so we were as fast as possible trying to um, uh, review the applications and, and get people eligible for, for SNAP benefits. And then I, I would say that the second issue was managing um, the COVID issue in the homeless population. I really want to say that we had great partners with Salvation Army, Catholic Charities, Rescue Mission. Um, but through this COVID uh, time period, just want to give you an idea, we, we ended up having to quarantine 84 homeless individuals in, in a local um, hotel um, to prevent widespread uh, COVID uh, illness in the shelter population. And um, I really shout out to our community partners because it was going to be a real disaster if hundreds of people living in homeless shelters all got sick. So um, um, I think, but, but we were handling that. That was kind of all happening at once. And <laughs> Then also part of the county executive's focus is, is serving and making sure essential workers could work. So um, we have since March um, sought and received a child care subsidy waiver from the state. And this has allowed us to serve families with incomes at 85% of the state medium income. So that's significantly higher than 200% of the poverty level, which is our current eligibility level. Um, so we also waived the parent share so that there would not be a cost to parents during this time. And we filled in absences 
uh, for the child care providers. And that really has helped keep some of the child care system in Onondaga County intact. I talked to my colleagues across the state, a lot of counties have really lost their child care capacity because uh, when you don't infuse the dollars, when there's absenteeism, the, the centers, the child care uh, providers have to shut down. So we, I think as a, as a large county, we're kind of on the cutting edge to help keep our local capacity uh, intact. Now, it's not what it used to be. Before COVID, we had 14,000 slots. Right now we have 5,000 slots. Uh, and we're still trying to figure out what do we need to do to uh, preserve the current childcare slots um, and grow that back, grow back our capacity. But there are a lot of issues. Uh, primarily, parents are still very uh, fearful about having their kids go back to childcare because it's a congregate kind of setting. So um, that's, that's kind of the big picture, um, what has been going on. As far as uh, the rest of the program areas, the state did uh, provide a lot of waivers, which put a moratorium on um, activity. For instance, we get to do all our work now through the telephone versus face-to-face -face requirements. Um, we anticipate sometime in August or September us having to go back into the face-to-face -face, uh, meeting requirements with, with clients. Um, also, the state was really trying to say, don't cut people's, people's benefits off. Don't cut temporary assistance benefits off. Don't cut, cut SNAP benefits off. Do not cut heat benefits off. Don't cut Medicaid benefits off. So they kept pushing out <coughs> the recertification process. Um, which is great on one hand, because that means uh, recipients um, re are still receiving services, but that pushes our work down the road. So we anticipate starting in September that our recertification process um, will double in, in, in September. So just to give you an example, for the month of September, we usually have, we'll have 2100 uh, SNAP applications that we have to re-review and decide if someone is still eligible for that. We're looking at it now 4100. Uh, uh, temporary assistance, we're looking at usually 640. Now we're looking at almost 1300. So, um, and it's going to be the same for Medicaid. Um, and then as soon as the courts start opening up again, we are going to have an influx of seeking child support um, for a lot of clients. Uh, currently, uh, we're, we're not able to really do a lot in child support because of the court's limited um, availability. So um, that's kind of where we're at. Um, all of our program areas have seen increases because of COVID. Um, I don't know if we're gonna uh, see huge increases. Uh, they range from anywhere from 2% to a 5% increase. Um, but uh, this isn't going away soon. So I think that prior to COVID, we were really seeing a decrease across the board in all of the utilization of public benefits. Um, now COVID has caused an uptick uh, and we'll, we'll see if the trend holds. So um, I hope that gives you an overview on what we're trying to do. And um, um, we're, we're busy. It, 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 uh, um, we, the client traffic when COVID started, it was about 50 a day. Um, now coming to the second floor, and again, we have limited client traffic to all go to the second floor so we can um, control the traffic in the two buildings um, for health and safety purposes. Um, but now we're um, up around 150 to 175 people coming into the building. So you, you can sense by the traffic that's happening that the increase in need is starting to happen.
Uh, Julie, I don't know if that is the overview you were looking for. Yes, I think it's, okay. yes. I mean, we obviously understand that you guys are getting slammed down there. I mean, it's an obvious, you know, cause and effect with COVID, um, but I think it's important to hear and understand even just your assessment of how many people are coming in now. So you get a, a visual sense, if you will, in your head of what, what you're dealing with. Can I ask a random question? I've wondered this, um, and I, it may seem kind of elementary, but I'm, I am interested. When, in terms of childcare, okay, and talking about providers and, and everything else, when we talk about centers, does that include like somebody with a home daycare certification? Like if, if my child was going, I apologize, ah, one of my villages calling, <laughs> um, but I wonder like, does that reimbursement go to like a home daycare provider yes. or no? It does. So, okay. So as long as you're so, certified as part of the system. So the, the waiver covered all child care providers except for informal child care providers. Those are usually half are, are grandparents, basically half are other um, friends uh, caring for one child. All right. Yeah. So the waiver covered, all center-based care, group, family care. Um, and so that's half of, uh, yeah, it's more, it's, it's probably 60% of our child care system. And the waiver um, is covering those payments. Now, again, we can only pay providers for children that are receiving subsidies. A lot of providers obviously have parents that pay, are self-pay, completely 100% pay the full ride on their own. We really can't help in those cases, but we, we are helping with any subsidized slot. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Sarah? Yes, yes, I do. Um, Sarah, it yes. looked like quite a few people retired out of your department. Yes. So how are you doing with your staffing? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I, I think it's going to be tough. Um, but I understand the department is part of the county and the county right now is in financial dire straits. So, um, but you're right. Um, that between retirements and vacancies, we're about down about 11% of our workforce. And so when all of the waivers are lifted by the state, uh, when all of the pushing the work down the road are lifted, um, I, am, I am concerned. Uh, at, at right now, I will be pu pushing a lot of overtime and I'm, I'm hoping that staff will, will be willing to work overtime. But um, that's a really important question. Um, and uh, uh, we're, we're gonna do our best. Well, hopefully we'll be able to help you. Well, thank you. Again, though, I, I really, I, mean, I understand the county, this department is part of the county whole, and, and I really understand the dire situation we're in, so got to be a partner. Thank you, Sarah. I, I just want to let you to know also I in the overview that um, with unemployment possibly ending the end of July, we anticipate an uptick again in SNAP applications. So that's going to be one area where we're going to see an increase in business. And then the state, the governor's moratorium on evictions ends August 20th. And if he doesn't extend that, that's when we're going to see the flood of people coming in. And that's why we want to be prepared with the dollars that you just supported. Uh, because August 20th, we, we expect a lot of people coming in um, once the evictions are um, handed out. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you so much. Very, really sure. appreciate it. And send our shout outs back to your staff, please. I will. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Hang Thank in there. you, Sarah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. So um, 
I put a call into um, Dr. Gupta. I'm not sure. Is Dr. Gupta on? Yes, I am. Yay. I'm here, our, Julie. Our wonderful health commissioner, burning the candle at both ends. Um, just for an update in general, there's, you know, um, and I wanted to give everybody on the committee an opportunity to ask any questions um, that we may have in, in this very complex and, and broad area we now know as COVID. So um, Dr. Gupta, is there anything, would you just like to start us with where we're at, what, where you're at, or anything important you think we should know? Right, so thank you for inviting me to the health committee as a chairwoman and to the, all the members of the health committee. I can see everybody's face. Um, uh, it's just nice to see you all virtually. Um, I hope you're all good. Um, what I would like to give you a quick overview and then open up for question and answer. If there is any way I can share the screen, um, then I can kind of go over some that will be helpful to all of you as we move forward. Uh, who can provide me? Because I don't. I could not share it last time I tried to do it. It says I most disabled participant screen sharing. Correct. So is there somebody can share, allow me to have that so I can? Jamie, can you do that? Yep, I'm working on that right now. Awesome, thank you. So in the meantime, when I am getting that permission, um, COVID... Um, you should be able to right now. Oh, I can? Okay, let me see. Uh, okay, let's see. So it will go to share. So you will see, uh, let me know if you can see my screen, which has like a big, huge yep. map. There it goes. Okay, yeah. great. So um, today, tomorrow will be four months since we announced our first case of COVID-19 in our community, March 16, that was. And here we are four months and we have lots of cases. So I just wanted to um, divide the presentation in sort of a, what is the current status? Uh, globally, state, and at our local level, and uh, what are we doing, and what what tools we have, um, and how we are handling as we are moving forward. How hopefully that will cover uh, many of your questions you might be asking. So this is the Johns Hopkins map I have shared with you before. You can see globally thir more thirteen more than thirteen million. Uh, global deaths are uh, five hundred seventeen thousand seventy nine thousand. If you look at the sidebar of this map where my cursor is, you can see US has uh, 3.4 million. It kind of gives you whole um, picture that how dire it is as compared to the rest of the world. Um, I think it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, as we go from our county in terms of um, uh, from the state, from the US point of view, this is another map by the Johns Hopkins, which gives you a kind of color-coded map of the where, um, sorry, where, uh, sometimes these things happen, I'm going to go back and then try to go back to the map. Um, that how many, um, sorry, um, that how many cases the county, uh, so the United States have, uh, over three million, uh, many people have died, including in our community also. So this is the map which you, it's coming, it's a GIS map. And how can you access it? So if you do Google coronavirus.jhu.edu uh, uh, slash US map, it will give you, uh, you can see the, the darker it is, the worse it is. So you can see all that area where you're seeing the more cases are appearing. Um, that's how the travel advisory comes into the picture. There is a, uh, formula which J Johns Hopkins actually um, uses uh, by showing that how per, um, uh, let's see, I'm going to go to the here testing, how it takes you into different uh, places where testing is being done. And if you go to the tracker, it tells you uh, where the most cases are. I think this is important information as uh, communities are open, people are traveling, uh, and it gives you state by state how many new cases, and it gives you sort of a rolling average. That's the reason, that's the, that's the basis for the travel advisory uh, by the governor, and that's how uh, he updates it. Um, as far as going towards how is our at local level, I think it's important for 
you to know how we look at our local level. So I'm going to show you our web page. Uh, where is that web page? So uh, this is our county um, health department. I'm just going back words to go into our uh, this is our county health department web page. Uh, if you click on Corona, this COVID-19 uh, icon, it takes you to the COVID-19 page, which has at the top, as you can see, home page, news, local data, testing, uh, different forms, reopening guidance, resources, and FAQ. Um, there is a, uh, on the, we try to make it very visual friendly for all of you, uh, for the community that report a complaint, report release request, workplace recovery, and the state uh, uh, also takes you directly to the state. As you can see, there are multiple things which are listed without going into too much detail. I think, I hope um, I'll give you this homework so you will be able to review that on your own leisure time and bedtime reading is, there are lots of things there. You see the active links here. You click on it, it will take you to the next page. Travel advisory is also listed here, list of the states. As it goes to when you are looking at it, when I click onto that link, it takes you to the um, governor's page and it actually gives you the whole read the guidance. So it every information it at, at your literally at your fingertips. Um, so when I am looking at the data, uh, at the local data, I think it's very important as um, legislature that you should know what is happening. We update it every day. Uh, county executive have been updating uh, that information in his uh, uh, daily conferences. Now they're a couple of times a week. Um, how it is essentially that it gets updated. So you can do by municipality, by town. Uh, and the town and also by the city of Syracuse specifically we put the dashboard so if you click and there I'll take you to the dashboard and there is a lot of other information we put it how many new cases you have you can go there and at the same time you have it written down here how many confirmed cases so far we have 3,000 uh, over 3,000 cases we have active cases like 270 it means so many people have recovered recovered 2,585 uh, then we are talking about deaths, 111 people have died, and nursing home deaths are 80 at this point, and then also results tested. Um, we also have a lot of information how the transmission occurs. If you continue to go down at that page, it will give you the hospitalization data. Uh, it's a very trend which we try to see, so you don't have to be a statistician to, to review that. You can see how things are, and I think it's important as the community is open, why this data is important, because if uh, more people get sick, they end up in a hospital, they occupy those uh, beds and also decrease the capacity. By doing so, they decrease the capacity of any hospital in our local community to take care of heart attack, asthma, uh, surgery, and all those things. So that's, they go into the surge and the people cannot get the right care. So fortunately, we have been able to avoid the things which we as a health department which do is promote prevention and work, work in terms of a case investigation, contact tracing, as you have heard about those, a lot of those things all the time, is to avoid the surge in the hospital so people can have opportunity. Uh, overall, 80% of people pretty much don't um, have, they have mild symptoms, 14% uh, or so may have much more serious symptoms, may require hospitalization, some of them, and out of the 5%, 5% end up in a very, very severe critical situation requiring uh, mechanical ventilation, we call intubation, and can die also. So a lot of those things to try to protect those individuals who have underlying health problems, who, have, um, who are elderly, uh, are the one who actually pay the price for those uh, for those things, which young and healthy people might say, hey, I'll get it. That's all right. I'll get recover. Yes, you can recover. But your grandparents, your friend, or your uncle or aunt who may have problems, they may not recover. So pretty much everybody who doesn't, uh, who says that, oh, we don't want to wear masks, 
we don't want to do physical distancing or we don't want to you know follow uh, like hand sanitization or or what we call public health uh, ask for um, for the prevention to transmit the virus from one person to another one is pretty much looking at 10 people down the road having a death somewhere or having hospitalization which is very harsh thing to say but at the same time it's a reality we all need to understand that and accept that what we do action today uh, is really impact others and that's what we are uh, trying to pretty much uh, uh, do it um, so here when the other thing which i wanted to bring it to your attention i think for for you to see um, is uh, when we are looking for reopening guidances are there in which you have people often ask, uh, we are in phase four, uh, what are the guidances? Uh, what is the guidance state gives? What is the guidance county gives? Um, so from the county, from the health perspective, uh, we have taken a lot of information. If you click all these things, it takes you to phase four of opening, right? You can file a complaint. Um, and also when we look into um, the Onondaga County Workforce Recovery Guide, which is based on the CDC's proposed OSHA guidelines, which are also listed at the bottom of the page in the CDC here. When we look at the resources here, OSHA uh, guidance of preparing. What we did when we created the Workplace Recovery Guide, we put, I clicked on that link and it takes you into a very succinct information uh, has a table of content, which has three basic principles. One is you want to protect staff. You want to protect the, uh, the clients. The client could be um, a restaurant patrons, or they could be a hospital patients, or they could be um, anybody in, in the farm. People are getting and getting things. Um, or anywhere, you can think of your own business model and then say business and say, what would be my client? Um, so you have to protect both staff because sick staff is going to give infection to the client and sick client is going to give infection to the, the, the staff. And at the same time, they both are in going to be an environment. It means that we need to protect the environment like your workplace, wherever we are, to have all the right tools, um, making sure that we are having uh, sign up sheets, we are having temperature checks, we are having travel a, a questionnaire actually, and document it, making sure that if somebody is sick, uh, should not come to work, but if they do come, ended up not knowing, they take the temperature and they go home. Uh, the supervisor should guide that. We have implemented through throughout since the beginning because in, in our ninth floor, and we were in 12th floor, even in basement where we have BDC, we have staff um, here physically doing the case investigation and contact tracing since the first day, even before we were preparing. So we have almost full, many of majority of our staff is here. Um, they have flexibility to work from home if they need to, just because we are doing work from home uh, weekends also. We are pretty much doing seven days a week work and uh, nonstop. Uh, that, is, that is important until this pandemic um, is behind us. I think that's important for us to think. So what are we doing in terms of, uh, so this is one, uh, one other thing. Uh, the other thing which I wanted to say, so three principles. We are testing uh, with the help of emergency management. We have actually done multiple mobile testing. County has done, county executive has done a tremendous job is putting people together and uh, providing opportunity for testing. Um, and testing is the key ingredient to identify people who are um, uh, who should be put in isolation because they are sick, and then also identify their friends and families who should be put in quarantine. Uh, the word isolation is applied for case, quarantine is applied for the contacts. And by doing so, what we are asking people to, we are interrupting the cycle of transmission. Uh, and then the third component, 30, is treat. Treatment is the medical treatment, which our health systems do. And treatment is not only just the providing support system. You heard Sarah talking about the whole uh, uh, support system which county has put together. Her department has been really at the forefront of it. We, can thank, we cannot thank enough to our county partners and also community-based partners who have been working with us day in, day out. You know, meal deliveries and support system, mental health, uh, transportation, anything, a lot of those things, medication deliveries. Our department works with 
all of them pretty much. So we, we, it's like, you know, the way I say as a physician is that as an internist, I took care of patients as such as a whole. It means you can't just take care of your eyes or nose or throat or heart, um, your arm or leg. We can have specialization, but overall we are all one. And that's what our role has been to make sure we bring everybody together and become part of all together. That's what we call public health system, including you, which are the important part of the public health system. Uh, so what other additional tools we have, I think for your information is executive orders have played significant uh, important role in terms of doing our work, both at governor's level as well as in a county, um, at the county level. So at this point, a couple of executive orders which are at the state level, as you know, has been for the mask, uh, which, which I uh, definitely will have everybody to um, always make sure you promote and you within your family and friends and your communities. You as legislators have such a, a strong um, microphone that you can actually, you know, uh, pretty much have people follow you. It is very important whether do by Twitter or by your social media or by talking to them because they look up to you, they elected you. So my biggest ask it will be that you you support this initiative and then you promote that because at the end of the day, uh, all these things have to work together. We want our businesses open. We want our community to recover. The only way it can recover if we follow the principles, the proven principles of the, the uh, what you call non-pharmacological intervention. There are no treatment here at this point. There's no vaccine here, but these are proven by making sure staff doesn't come to work when they are sick. People don't, you know, transmit, they don't go to party when they are sick. Putting the physical distances to six feet or more um, and making sure we wear mask. Uh, it is a respect, it is a fashion statement. I mean, I hate to say that, that's what, so I walk with this here, I have this. Uh, you know, this is important when people come to my door. I'm on Mother's Day, I had somebody deliver a flower. My daughter must have, if they did, and. I literally have to kind of put my mask on and and uh, take that delivery and the person had his mask on too. So it was nice to see, right? We said hello and, and talked and I said, thanked him. And and small things make a difference because we I want to protect him, he wants to protect me. Um, the executive order at the county level has been very, very helpful. Uh, when when County Executive Ryan put first for the testing that people have to stay home before their test results, which is some sort, of, sort of a modified at this point that for the if they're asymptomatic, they can go to work, but if they're symptomatic, they should stay home. And also for uh, the new one, which is important uh, for our um, uh, the uh, employers because people are back to work and what is happening that employees are getting sick. They are part of the community. It is the fact of life. They will happen. There is no finger pointing here. The point is when we do case investigation, these are people who live their lives, which we should. Um, human are social animals. They are going to do get together. Again, not too big, not to try to mingle with everybody who you don't know. Uh, I think it's important that when they go to work, if they're asymptomatic, we do investigation, and employer, we want them to be really cooperative with us. So that executive orders help us to get the roster from them and we can ask them to get tested so we can actually put people you know, in quarantine. So that is important. Okay. That's, but the last but the least part, the important part is help in enforcement. Um, and our law enforcement has been helpful in not only delivering, delivering orders when we needed them, when the county was all closed, they were very strong partners in, in hand delivering orders to them uh, because that's what we needed. At this point, we still uh, ask them if we have somebody non-compliant, we ask them to go in uniform and then deliver it. So it just gives a little visual presentation that people need to be very compliant. Most of the time we have, I mean, it's more of a community service uh, with their help. I think that's what we have been able to do. And uh, uh, travelers and non-compliant, I think you all know probably New York State has put uh, people at the airport and when people are coming, they have an online form as well as the hard copy, uh, which that's uh, distributed in the airplanes. But the online version is available for those people who are driving as well as when they are in the plane, they can fill that form out. Um, not following that will have $2,000 uh, pretty much uh, fine and they will be subject to forced quarantine, which is in the spirit of in not importing the transmission of virus from those 
I showed you the, um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. I don't think I have to show Dr. anything Gupta, at this point. Dr. That will be important. So I'll, I'll be open for the questions now. Dr. Gupta, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, meetings, uh, your professional opinion. Should we still be holding these meetings online? Uh, should we be meeting as a group? I mean, there's, uh, we're separating, but when we have the whole group, it's still a lot of people in one room. What's your professional opinion? Right. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, a lot of it is the, the group setting within, um, again, if they are a small number of people, you can have social distancing, you can have face masks. Uh, but I would prefer if, if, I mean, I prefer online meetings at this point because we bring ourselves to that one. It just also provides flexibility um, to, um, to everybody essentially at this point. But I, I'm not totally against that. Um, to have those meetings, certainly the preference will be online if they can be done, because you can achieve quite a bit by, you know, by sharing screens and, and by, um, I'm just going to stop sharing screen. How do I stop sharing? Okay. Okay. So I think it's important that this is as, as a body, you should feel comfortable, not comfortable, uh, smaller rooms, so staying away. The only thing is if one of you become positive, we will do contact, contact investigation. And then if we do not find those people, uh, if somebody public is attending is, we do have to do um, what you call the um, release uh, to the social, um, uh, to sorry, press release uh, to make sure that people get tested. That's how we do a lot of time. Our case investigation uh, interviews the person and goes to the detail if you attended a meeting. So if you attended a meeting, were people wearing masks? were they physically distant if they were physically distant and that was a large enough room that was allowable thing by the state guidance at this point that will be appropriate and there would be no other consequences we will feel comfortable providing that guidance if we can find somebody we cannot find somebody who attended that meeting then it just becomes a question and that's how the, the when you see the releases uh, whether it's a bar or whether it's a Wegmans or whether it's a um, other uh, tops or different things which we have done and seen in the past because we couldn't find all the people and we wanted to alert people to be uh, to be watch out for the symptoms. We weren't concerned that much concerned that the people should be put in uh, what we call the mandatory quarantine, but we were concerned enough to say that watch out for your symptoms. If you have underlying health problems, if you have immune problems, if you're elderly, certainly you should uh, talk to your doctor and get tested and monitor symptoms for 14 days. I think that is the best advice, um, which I would give it to anybody. And I think you should give it to anybody. Dr. Gupta, um, in terms of the 4th of July, um, graduation parties, et cetera, how concerned are you and what would the time frame be for a spike? A so usually anytime there is a party, um, so it's, it's a complicated answer. So let's say there are 10 people attended one party and they, um, uh, they, one or two people became positive in that one. And uh, so we can say, okay, that was one party and you can have 10 different parties or small parties. But those people who attend this party, they couple of weeks, maybe three, four days down the road, they actually went another party. By the time they were already getting positive, they had not been tested. So they exposed that many people three days, four, four, sorry, five to seven days later. Usually 80% of people start to, to have positive tests, 80% by seven day, uh, and 100% will be by day 14. That's why we say 14 days quarantine. So if they attended that party somewhere seven or eight days down the road, and they were already was positive there, but they didn't know because they didn't have much symptoms, or they had maybe little sniffles, which could be a symptoms, but they didn't kind of, oh, it's allergy, I'm having summer hay fever, and all those things people come, oh, I wanna to go to the party, right? That's how we hear that all the time. And they exposed, they didn't know that, they exposed that many people. Now you have four or five people positive from this party. Those people who were still in that phase that they, seven days down the road, they attend a third party, right? So they are taking, so it's like a, um, cumulative thing, it goes from one party to another party to another party. So yes, 4th of July, we may not see that many surge, but that becomes cluster. They pretty much walk. 
So you are seeing, if you can visually, I wish I could show it to you that visually from here, one, you're going to the different one in that time frame. then you go to the third one, and that's how it just becomes bigger and bigger. In the second party, you may have seven people get infected now. Those seven people went to five different parties, and if they went into seven days down the road or eight days down the road, they infected, exposed more than many people. So you can see that how it can escalate from one person to 30 or 50 people, right? In, in, in a matter of in a month or so, you can have a large number of cases. So that's why it's so crucial for people to understand that when we say social, dis I want to use physical distancing, social use distancing is lot of sort of a misnomer at times. Uh, we are socially here together, um, but the physical distancing, it's important um, that, that, I mean, I can tell you that when I tell my daughter lives far away and then she's from one of the states, if she's going to come here and I said, you are going to be quarantined very hundred percent. She said, I don't want to come home. I said, well, that's what it is. It will be, you will get your food and everything. After two weeks, you'll be allowed to, I will have a hard time not to hug her. You know, that's what it is. That's the, that's the nature is, even though she's quarantining herself there. Uh, but I'm just going to follow the same guidelines as I give it to anybody. So I hope that answers your question. It is complicated. So we will. So when you see the numbers today um, and from the 4th of July, you will see two weeks. Oh, we didn't see that much surge. That could be sort of a not true indicator because those things will continue to escalate. And if we are seeing the uptrending it, and we are seeing those get together popping up in different places, and that every time I see, I just feel like, oh no, oh no, but that's what it is. So my, my, I am begging you, I'm asking you, I'm requesting you with, with, um, with my both hands clasped and, and then asking, please, please um, ask your um, constituents uh, in your website, in your Twitter, whatever you use it, promote all these things. It is so important. You are the leader. You are the one they listen to you and they will follow your guidance in there. They voted for you. They are going to listen to you. Um, so it's more than they will listen to me. That's what I would say. So I'm hopefully I'm giving you enough to, if you have any questions, any doubts about that, that you will, um, you will take um, a few moments to, to, you know, ask either question or that promote this, uh, these um, pretty much prevention strategies and public health strategies. Um, so I have, a, a, it's funny, the town of Skinny Atlas, the village, we had a, an issue um, at, you know, we've had a couple of pop up and the town, the village and myself were, were putting together a, a letter to the community and really trying to promote it to do whatever we can. So I don't know, I guess off Dr. Gupta's guidance, I'd encourage everybody to try and do that. Um, again. So the other question, and then I'll open to everybody else's questions. The other question that I had was with, with the state guidance regarding travel. Okay, in the form you have to fill out. Are you involved at all? Are they asking for you to administer any of that? And how, um, do you have any information on how they're gonna actually track that? Right, so it's a great question. So we are involved, but we are not involved. It's kind of mixed answer. Uh, so we know everything. We state actually to keep, so they have to keep us involved because we are the local uh, you know, foot soldiers here. Uh, however, our workload, all the, of the all counties has been so significant how they have rolled it out at this point and at our request actually they did uh, in the initially when they were rolling it out they asked us the feedback um, and then what um, you might have heard of those contact tracers by the uh, bloomberg uh, philanthropy right they have been the pcg contact tracers they call state contact tracers so when they fill out the form uh, at the state uh, gets those they put that information into a case management system, what you call ComCare. Uh, this is what we use also. Our cases all go into there when we get all downloaded the labs from the state, um, state's website, state's uh, electronic laboratory reporting system. Then those um, data entry from the airport or from the online, they will all go into that system and they will be sent to those contact tracers, the state contact tracers they are they contact them and then they make the phone calls they involve them in text messaging uh, sort of thing ask them to do temperature checks and it's pretty active engagement actually and then um, after 14 days they will be released if people are going back to their communities if they are coming here 
of course they are free to go. Nobody is being imprisoned here. That's not the point of that. But while they are here, they are going to have restricted movement. If they come from professional work, they are going to go to professional work and come back. That's how uh, essential worker essentially. If they are coming for just for fun, that makes it a little complicated. So that's how we are here complaints. Uh, New York State has also a complaint line. Um, I know county executive also gets those complaints and we get it also. And then we kind of deal with case by case basis. People are calling left and right. I mean, we are getting emails, contact us from our contact us page, somebody from Florida. My neighbor is going back there. They are going to see this and this person. Can you do something about that? Okay. It's kind of hard thing to do because you know it's, it's, a, it's a privacy issue and we don't even have information. So all this, what we are talking about right now really helps because you as a constituent, you as, a, as, as a, your community leader are telling your constituent, if you are inviting your friends and family from out of state, please make sure they don't go out and do certain things and stay in your home and quarantine and make sure you, if they have a case, at least they can be tested. So everybody really, it's individual responsibility. So we as a public health department, I as a commissioner look at the whole county as such like 467,000 plus people. But each individual has a personal responsibility in there to see how, what can they do to contribute to protect not only their families, but the neighborhood they are in the community they are. And that's, it's a two way street. It's like we need two hands to clap, I always say. You know, I can do like this, but it will be like just this. So I will do this. It just claps much larger. So I think we are looking, we can't do it alone. We can't. And we, the, a lot of those things which we ask for everybody to work together because we can achieve a lot more. It's a teamwork. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Gupta? Okay, I pre we appreciate uh, you. Uh, yeah. Julia, Julia, Julia I, can I ask you a question? Or make yeah. a comment, rather? Yes. Um, Dr. Gupta, thank you for all that you're doing. Um, it's, it's been, you've been giving us information that we really need, and I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that you've been working so hard to keep this county where it should be. Um, on the airport situation, my nephew, my grandson is here. He came to the airport, and he's being, he's being tracked. They text every day. I take his temperature every day. His 14 days are up now, but um, it's a very good system, but I thought it was coming from you. I didn't realize it was coming from the state. They don't, they don't, they don't identify themselves. They just say they're calling to check on the person. And, and I thought it was your people. And I was going to say, you're really, you're really working long hours because they call in the evening. They call right. at you know, holidays, weekends, and, yeah. and it's very strange. But, but it's a very good system, and they're very careful, and, and uh, we've done the right thing, and he's fine. He's 13, and he's, he's fine. But um, we didn't know it was going to be quite so, so detailed. Right, right, it is. And this is pretty much, that's how the model Linda works for, for our contact investigations when they do. So when uh, it was rolled out, in the beginning, when you have small number of cases, it's easy to track everybody. When you have keep on, everything keeps on dripping to the work, when you have more and more cases, it does become very hard. So I think this system has really worked very well at this point for the contact tracing uh, we don't call it travelers at this point. So for the travelers quarantine and uh, when they said first, you have to track them and we looked at caseload, most of the, at least the mid to large size counties, we didn't have capacity to do that because you have to hire more staff and we are already scrapped on the budget for, so I'm not going to ask go and to come to you and to the, to the county executive that, hey, give me 10 more staff to do that, which is not something we, we can't do. So uh, that's where the, I think Bloomberg philanthropy came into the really, really stepped up. And that's the role of the community leadership, I think, and the national leadership and came. And then uh, the, the governor pretty much worked with them to have implemented this system in place. What we, so their supervisor give us that. So they work with us, Linda. I think it's important to know that we work side by side. We, the way it is that we have, leadership team in a COVID response team in our, count, in, in our health department, in which um, supervisors have different case investigator and contact tracers. Like you can think of the little parallel, like a longitudinal arm. Um, and it, the supervisor responsible to oversee their case investigator and contact tracer. 
they have any issues, they bring it to medical directors, then it comes to me at times. Um, and we pretty much monitor on a daily basis. And the same arm which we created with our community county uh, health department leadership that who works with the, uh, the PCG contact tracer with the state ones, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the Bloomberg one, is that we have a daily huddle with them once or twice a day and they share information and say, this is what is happening, this is what is happening. We also provide, if, if we have a lot of overflow, they actually take our overflow from our staff also to do the contact tracing. So it has been great partnership started to evolve quite a bit. It took a little while. It was a little bit of a kind of, we have to figure it out how to do it right. And we, and we continue to look at the data and look at that, how it's working and have our, my team leadership has been very engaged and I get the reports uh, with them on a, on a very regular basis. So um, it's a work in progress. Well, thank and you I'm very glad much. to hear that you had a great experience, your nephew had it. So it is nice to hear. Thank you. Deb Cody, I think you had a question? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, thank you, Dr. Gupta, um, obviously to you and your whole team uh, for everything that you've done over these past months. I, I'm just curious about the, the antibodies testing. So in the beginning, you know, everybody was kind of anxious to get the antibodies testing. A lot of people thought, you know, they had been sick in February and March and wanted to know if they had it. But that's, it's since proven that that's not, you know, how, how reliable is that or, or that it does not, as was hoped, like potentially provide protection from future infection. And then I was also wondering how that affects the plasma project at Upstate. Um, because that was touted also as if you've had it and gotten over it, those antibodies would potentially protect others. So I was hoping maybe you could just kind of expand on that a little bit for us. Sure. Great question. So in general, um, anytime there is a, the principle of immunology is, or vaccination is that you have some sort of a protection whenever there's infection comes to the body, the, your body reacts. We are, I mean, it's a perfectly made system. I mean, Nobody can recreate that, I think. No machine can replicate that. So the human body is the perfect example. It will create the defense. It will try to stop the virus. If it can't, people get sick. But in the meantime, your immune system starts to recognize the different cells of cells, so what you call T cells and B cells, uh, without going into the details of that. So the both are responsible to provoke immune response. Depending on if the virus or bacteria, you can have uh, antibody or you can and at the same time when you have antibodies which are produced mostly by the B cells you can have the T cell response which is like a memory cells the, your body remembers oh I was exposed to these things and I'm going to react the next time I'm going to expose usually there's a combination of T and B in in general for most of the time viral responses or bacterial responses and that's why the vaccines do work when you're talking MMR and all those vaccines do work and has really saved life over the you know, uh, lifetime of ours essentially that we have seen vaccines. Um, in this situation, um, the antibody are produced like any, uh, the, the, the body has produced this response, but since it's a novel, it's, remember it, it is called novel coronavirus. Um, in the beginning, there was a nomenclature of different thing and CoV and all those things what call uh, the N stands for a, a novel, novel is new. So it's a novel coronavirus, which is a sort of a variation of common cold virus, but it's not a variation, it's a mutant in a way you can say. It became strong because it jumped from animal species to human species. In doing so, it became much more stronger and much more pathogenic. It means it, it really created more infectiousness to the people. And that's what we started to learn. So it does produce some immune response, produces antibody, but over the time frame, which came out from different countries, is that it's not protective because people are getting reinfection, uh, which we have seen. Um, and um, if that's the case, we, even though we can test that, uh, people should not rely on that, uh, should not, when I say not in capital letters, uh, is that, oh, I got that exposed to that, I can get it again. That is wrong at this point. That is not true. What we know information 
at this point and it will hold true. And that will be a concern for the, sometimes even for vaccine, how good that vaccine, that's why it takes time. If you push the vaccine out fast, you have no way of knowing that it vaccine will be protective. Of course, there are multiple vaccine being trialed, but at the same time, are they being protective? I think there is a uh, phase that one of the human trial is going to be started with another one of the vaccine. And these are the things which will be looked upon before that goes into much larger manufacturing for the rest of the community will not happen until next year. And still the next year, even when it goes, we have to go through the couple of cycles to see, is it really working? There's no seasonal variation. What is the seasonal variation? Um, so antibodies are just the indicator that somebody has been exposed to. What is the true value of that from where I stand? I would rather have people get tested for whether you have infection or no, rather than antibody, because it is giving me much more actionable item to, to have people you know, do the case investigation, interviewing them and putting people in isolation and, and their contacts and quarantine. To your second question, which you asked about the plasma um, project at the upstate, or it, I mean, throughout the nation, uh, it started in, I think, uh, the, uh, the, in the New York state, they started in Mount Sinai, and then uh, upstate became involved with that also. Uh, so you have to have uh, three weeks or over to have, then they check it. So that's a pooling of many antibodies. So there are specific criteria for that, what the initial reports have come out that if somebody is sick, it can become a life-saving for some people who are very sick because you are, you are pushing the antibody in somebody's body, which doesn't have that in a larger quantity. Uh, so smaller quantity is not that effective, but larger quantity, uh, I think it's still going on in ongoing investigation at this point, but that's a one tool the hospitals do have it at this point. In certain situation, they can use it. There are some medication trials that are also underway at this point, which I think multiple hospitals are participating in it. Uh, so I hope that answered your question. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Gupta? We've taken a significant amount of time, but I think it's, it's important for all of us to be able to communicate with you. And I appreciate our conversation we had in which you stated you'd be willing to, you know, update the legislature, you know, more frequently. Um, and I, I, I think that would be an awesome thing. So just yeah. keeping the lines open. So thank you. So I think I, everybody would agree. Thank you so much. Thank you we, so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. And I think I would be happy to provide you information. I think it's important um, uh, to have a clear understanding. And also after this meeting, hopefully you will continue to look at the web page, even though it's a digital platform, we do try to make it very, very current and uh, uh, pretty much, I think I talked to my PIO and try to have certain things, especially with the travel, try to make it a little differently so people will have that information because nuances are happening every day and how do you keep up with that? So thank you all um, and um, um, have, a, have a wonderful week and stay safe. Take care of yourself and your family and your constituents. Thanks you for well. what you do. You as well. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Just need a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll move it. Thanks. I'll second. Peggy on the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. You guys, thank you so much. Have a thank great you, day. Julie. Okay. Bye, thank guys. Thank you, Dr. Gupta.